Hello, and thank you for coming. I'm Barbara Krauthammer from the History Department faculty, and just want to thank you all for coming out this afternoon um, to our History Department Writer-in-Residence lecture this year by Rebecca Onion. Um, in just a few minutes, my colleagues Marla Miller and Emily Redman are going to tell you a bit about the Writer-in-Residence program, and we'll also then introduce your speaker. But before we begin, I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge all of the people who've put in a tremendous amount of time and, and effort to make sure that our event and our entire Writer in Residence Week was a great success. Um, the History Department staff, especially Mary Lashway, Amy Flagg, Jessica Johnson, and Adam Howes, along with our graduate student, Chelsea Miller, um, who I was really tempted to call Chelsea Handler, but I knew that was wrong, <laughs> um, and our undergraduate assistants, they created and circulated the beautiful posters that you've seen. Um, they handled all of the travel and scheduling logistics, making sure that Rebecca got to Amherst and then has gotten all over campus this week. Um, they've made sure that we've had a working sound system, um, and most importantly, made sure that we have all of this delicious food in the back of the room. So please make sure to feed yourselves. Um, and then also a big thank you to the catering staff for making it look so beautiful. This year marks the 10th anniversary of the Writer in Residence program, and so in honor of this occasion, um, I'd like to first welcome Dean Julie Hayes, Dean of the College of Humanities and Fine Arts. Well, <laughs> thank you, Barbara. It's great to look out and see colleagues, students, and friends, and, and to welcome uh, you all and our distinguished visitor on behalf of the College of Humanities and Fine Arts. Uh, this is a wonderful series. I've, I've admired it ever since I knew of its existence, uh, these 10 years of uh, bringing writers to the history department and, and thinking about history and the craft of writing and communication. So uh, it's a uh, it's great to be here. I should say it's a special thrill for me because I'm a great fan of Rebecca Onions and I love those slate columns and extraordinary maps and artifacts and documents and things that she plucks from the vault. Um, and, and in fact, in particular, if you've been following this, but the, uh, the, the timeline that she just added is I think gonna distract me from many an afternoon where I should probably be doing something else. But uh, anyway, just fascinating things and, and wonderful moments of insight and, and uh, you know, perception uh, of moments, moments in the past and discussions of contemporary culture in, in terms of historical and literary research as well. Um, uh, but I believe we want, we're going to celebrate the, this 10th anniversary of, of, of a wonderful program now, and who better to talk about the history of a program in the history department than a couple of historians. So I am turning the podium over to Marla Miller and Sarah Rudman. Thanks, Julie. I want to add my own welcome to Barbara's and the Dean's, and thank you all for joining us for this uh, terrific event today. As some of you know now for the first time, or maybe knew before, this is a special year for the Writer in Residence program, which started in 2006. Here we are, a decade later, thrilled to be welcoming Rebecca Onion and celebrating the success of the program. So I just want to say a few words about the program and how it's evolved over time. The Writer in Residence program emerged from a series of conversations led by then graduate program director Larry Owens. Inspired by science communication programs, uh, which translate the insights of researchers for general audiences, Larry was eager to get students in our graduate program thinking more purposefully about writing history for general audiences. Dennis McNally, who is a UMass alum, a best-selling author and the publicist for The Grateful Dead, uh, one of our most you know, fondly recalled alumni, had given a talk on campus the year before called Why Write History for the Public? And in 2006, he was invited back to be our first writer in residence. And so began this terrific series, uh, perhaps the only one of its kind in the country. Since that time, we've had Charlie Sennett, Charles C. Mann, and Russell Shorto, as well as Debbie Applegate, Jill Lepore, and Tony Horowitz. Residencies in more recent years have been held by Robin D.G. Kelly, Adam Hotschild, and Amy Wilenz. Visitors give lectures like this one to the public. They visit classes, meet with students and faculty, and join us over lunches, dinners, and more casual conversations to talk about their craft and to help us improve our own writing and our practice as writers. 
The program wouldn't be possible without the generous support of Five Colleges, Inc., which underwrites about half the cost of the program. We're very grateful then to Nate Therian and Neil Abraham and his staff on Spring Street for their generous support of the residency and so many other initiatives that enrich the Five College graduate program in history. In addition, every year, the Writer in Residence program is supported by various co-sponsors. Over the past decade, we've enjoyed the partnership of UMass Departments of English, Journalism, and Afro-American Studies and others, as well as the assistance of various departments across the four colleges, from the Amherst College Department of Spanish to Hampshire College's Schools of Critical Social Inquiry and Interdisciplinary Arts. This year's residency is sponsored by Five Colleges, Inc., the History Department, and the Journalism Department. Through the years, it's been a delight to work with our colleagues across campus and around the valley to bring to Amherst these exciting authors who help us think every year about how best to engage the widest range of readers and the broadest audiences in the work and rewards of historical inquiry. So with that, I'm gonna turn the podium over to my colleague, Emily Redman, who will introduce this year's speaker, Rebecca Onion. Uh, thanks. Barbara, Julie, Marla. Um, I want to reiterate a really hearty thanks um, to the sponsors of tonight's events and uh, the week's activities of the Writer in Residence program, so Five Colleges, Inc., um, the History Department, and the Journalism Department. We really could not have done this without you. Thank you. Um, I am thrilled to introduce to you today my friend and colleague, Dr. Rebecca Onion. Um, who is, no pressure, sure to deliver a fabulous talk tonight. Um, Rebecca is currently the history writer at Slate.com, um, where she writes really wonderfully researched and compelling pieces on history and culture. Um, she's also author of Slate's document blog, The Vault, um, where she comments on and presents historic documents, images, and the like. Um, I really, really encourage you to check out her work. Uh, Rebecca is a prodigious writer. Um, at Slate as a freelance writer in articles, chapters, and reviews. Um, she's also an incredibly talented writer and recipient of more than a few prizes for the quality of her written word. And please do look out for her upcoming book, which is being published this fall um, by the University of North Carolina Press. It's titled Innocent Experiments, Childhood and the Culture of Public Science in the United States. Um, I have had the luxury of hearing a little bit more about one of the chapters, and I'm very, very much so looking forward to reading it. Um, I also wanted to say that lately, the History Department has encouraged um, audience members to live tweet your thoughts, ideas, and reactions to lectures, um, and this has been really successful. So we encourage you to do this um, or share on other social media what you learn here today. Um, and if you could, please use the hashtag um, WIR2016, so Writer in Residence 2016. Uh, we do ask that you be respectful to the speaker and be respectful to those around you as you are doing that, but please feel free to, um, to let the world know what's going on here today. So I am really pleased that UMass is able to host such a prominent public intellectual, and you're really all in for a treat today. So welcome, Rebecca Onion. Hi, everybody. Yeah, yeah. No mean tweets. <laughs> OK. Let's see if this works. Oh, eh, wrong charger. It's OK. We'll see. I know. Um, all right, I think it'll be fine. OK, so um, I wanted to open my talk today with a little story that I'm calling um, the parable of the pizza woman. So this is a picture that if you spend a lot of time online and follow a lot of sort of historically oriented accounts, you may have come across this picture. It often comes up with a variant of this caption. In 1921, early suffragettes often donned a bathing suit and ate pizza in large groups to annoy men. It was a custom at the time. <laughs> um, so some, you know, sometimes it's like reworded a little bit, sometimes it's a little different, but it's usually something like that. So I first saw it in September 2014. Um, I almost immediately saw a debunking on Snopes.com, the site that often sort of debunks urban legends and other um, sort of online myths. Uh, pra praise, all praise to Snopes.com for their fine work. And so um, I was looking back at my Twitter account and realizing over the past two or three years how often this um, same tweet had come up. 
So um, first I reacted in this fashion. <laughs> um, uh, pizza eating suffragettes in bathing suits, they're fake and everywhere. Um, you know, the, I, I you know, tried re, um, retweeting this um, link to Sharpie.com, which is a sort of wonderful photo archive online where I think the original um, Tumblr that first uh, appended the caption to this picture had found this picture. And on Sharpie, the, the caption is quite clear. This is a pie eating contest at Tidal Basin Bathing Beach in Washington, DC on July 31st, um, 1921. A perfectly nice photo taken by the National Photo Company. <laughs> but um, it, what's interesting, of course, is that you know early suffragettes in 1921, that doesn't make sense historically. Um, they're probably the earliest suffragettes you might, I don't know, you might date to 1850. Um, you know, it depends on what you're defining as suffragettes. But by 1921, um, of course, the um, amendment to allow women to vote had already passed. This was not definitely not early. <laughs> um, a pizza, you know, Sharpie, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Snopes.com sort of helpfully points out that um, yeah, pizza became much more popular after World War II when um, people who'd been serving overseas, soldiers brought back an affection for pizza from Italy. Um, so while some people might have been eating it in 1921, it, it seemed much less possible. But these facts did no harm to the online popularity of this photo. <laughs> um, the next time it popped up for me um, <laughs> was in, let's see, I think that was in uh, April 2015. Um, and then the last time I saw it was, <laughs> I just got super mad because it was retweeted by Emily Nussbaum, a TV critic from The New Yorker, shame, shame. <laughs> So quite often, this, uh, the, the, this, there's sort of a too-good-to-be-true quality to the pictures that go viral online that, um, that sort of it happens to the best of us phenomenon occurs where people who should maybe know better end up retweeting it. Okay, so I open with this little particular meme because it shows to me why picking apart history that happens on the web sort of outside of sp official spaces, so outside of you know, online archives that are maintained by museums or, um, you know, uh, special collections or sort of the tumblers or blogs that are also maintained by these places that are run by historians and trained archivists. Um, there is this side of history on the web that's the kind of side that a lot of, you know, professors at UMass might be involved in creating some of these archives and they're very carefully contextualized and beautifully done. Um, and then there is this other side, which is just what happens when the rubber meets the road. Um, and I'm interested, in, I'm interested in looking at the way that history happens in the wild on the web is the way I think about it. So something that I often run up against is the fact that, you know, there's the very first thing that you might think about this um, pizza eating suffragettes picture is, ah, oh, it's so inaccurate, it bothers me, like it's, so, it's been so reappropriated, that's just annoying. But I also think that it's sort of a unique opportunity to think about why people like history and, and what, what sort of resonates with them about this, this particular inaccurate caption. So in this case, um, you know, I think the annoy men part was really like the, the little beat at the end of that joke that really got people going. Um, but there's also this sort of idea that, um, that people in the past had these, you know, you like to think that there are things that happened in the past that um, might be something that you might want to do or might be something that would be like a fun protest for you in some way. Um, and it's just funny, it's, it's funny to think, in this case, this imagining was incorrect, but it is funny to think, you know, that these sort of tactics or strategies might have existed long before you existed. So I'm gonna talk a little bit today about um, the, some of the writing that I've done in the past three years since I started at Slate in November 2012. I've done a number of sort of theoretical pieces where I analyze and sort of unpack some of the themes that I'm gonna talk about today. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the blog posts where I've both subverted and upheld some of the paradigms for how history is circulated in the wild on the web. So I have a little list of things that I'm gonna talk about. Um, you know, I sort of uh, agonize a little bit over framing these as problems because um, that is sort of the way that I often end up writing. I have a sort of like a scoldy feeling about a lot of this stuff. And I don't necessarily mean to be as scoldy as probably I sound, but um, this is sort of the way I, fr I framed it. So I'm gonna talk about the problem of inaccuracy, which is also a problem of decontextualization. Um, the, the problem of coolness, 
which doesn't sound like it should be a problem, but as I'll show, is sometimes almost detrimental to, I would argue, um, the, the way that history works on the web. Um, the problem of relatability, which is a big uh, sort of word that is pretty popular now, I think, and I have a lot to say about the way that, um, the way that relatability works with people's affection for history. Um, and the problem of exploitation, uh, which is probably the darkest problem that I'm gonna talk about. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about some, uh, some places where history happens on the web outside of archives and museums that are actually kind of, um, kind of heartening or exciting to me. Okay, so first, in order to speak about accuracy and inaccuracy, let's start with history and pics. Does anyone follow history and pics online? Okay, some of you guys. <laughs> okay, so um, this is sort of the main account, which is a snapshot taken today. Is there a way to turn these lights off maybe? Might be easier to see? I don't know. Someone can do. Um, I mean, it's not like completely essential. Yeah, maybe that's any better. Okay, um, so history and pics today. Um, I wrote a piece about the history and pics phenomenon in early 2014, and at that time it had just passed a million, um, a million followers. I looked today and it has 2.85 million, so the angry piece that I wrote did no good whatsoever. <laughs> um, so um, history and pics, at the time that I, uh, I looked at it, uh, there were 14 different copycat accounts that I could find that sort of, um, kind of all stole from each other. And of course, there's like a lot of debate among the people who run these accounts about who's stealing from who. Um, and, but the history and pics account is probably the one that has gotten the most um, press and attention. The two uh, guys who run it who are, um, at the time that I wrote the piece, they were 19, so I guess they must be in their early 20s now. Uh, were able to monetize it in various ways and got a bunch of money from it. And so they sort of were more in the public eye for this account than the other less popular, less monetizable accounts. Um, so uh, they're, they're often sort of the same, they're sometimes the same pictures, often the same approach. A lot of them use the same Alexander Gardner daguerreotype of Lincoln um, as their avatar. So again, they're trying to sort of like copy from each other or steal each other's. They're hoping that when you search history and pics, they'll think that you're the account that they're, you're looking for, <laughs> that they're the account that you're looking for, and they'll follow you instead of the actual history and pics. Um, so when I wrote this piece, I, I wanted to get sort of a fair picture of the content and practices of the accounts. What I really wanted was to find out to what degree these accounts um, were attributing or dating their pictures. So I was sort of interested in accuracy, but I wasn't necessarily fact-checking the accounts, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and this is what my, how my piece is framed. As you can see from the, um, the deck, which is the sort of the subhead of this piece, um, what the argument of the piece was. The deck is wildly popular <laughs> accounts like history and pics are bad for history, bad for Twitter, and bad for you. <laughs> so um, my editor wrote that, but I stood behind it. <laughs> um, so I basically, I crunched some data. I took um, for the four biggest accounts at that time, which, which was at old history picks, at history and picks, at historical picks, and at history underline picks. So you get the idea of how they sort of grab you to follow them. Um, and I counted the total numbers of tweets. I looked at the number of the photos that had dates appended to them, um, even vague ones like, for example, the, in the last slide, that top pick here is just 1960s fashion. So I was sort of lenient and counted that as a date, <laughs> despite the fact that you know that could be debatable. Um, I looked at the number of photos with dates. I looked at those with any attributions at all. So I wanted to know whether these accounts ever said who had taken the picture. Um, and I also wanted to find out if anyone had sort of linked out to more information or whether it was a sort of like a dead end tweet. Um, and I wanted to find out what the most popular tweets of the week were. So it was sort of maybe unsurprising, maybe surprising to me to find out that there were um, very few dates and attributions. The most dating and most attributing account was um, at History and Picks. So they, did date, they dated 54%, which was high compared to my sample. But since it's an account about history, it seems <laughs> kind of sad. <laughs> um, and attributed 5%. Um, and there, were very, there was very few 
that linked to any sources or contextual information. One of the accounts clearly had sort of like a, um, like a clickbait content mill site set up that they were getting money from that they would link out to. So um, I forget what the URL was, but it was something like teenlife.com slash blah, 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 and it would be, they'd link out to like a listicle in their tweet. So this is something that, um, you know, like often critiques of these accounts uh, revolve around accuracy. So for example, um, here are some examples of wrong pictures that these <laughs> accounts have tweeted. So this is a tweet from Yoni Applebaum, who's the editor at The Atlantic and also a historian, who's actually, I think, coming this weekend for the history communication discussion. Um, and he pointed out that one of these accounts had tweeted a, a photo of Abraham Lincoln and Edgar Allan Poe that's actually from Abraham Lincoln Vampire Slayer, the movie, <laughs> as like a real tweet. Um, and likewise, um, this was another corrected history and pics tweet that I found online. This is just a, um, not a historian, just a, a concerned civilian who figured out that this uh, supposed photo of the USS, um, the battleship Missouri before a kamikaze attack is actually a, um, a set up photo of um, using toys. And I think it's by David Leventhal, the photographer. They wasn't able to determine that, but I think that's the case. Um, and so there is, but there's also, so this, this bothers me obviously, but what bothered me more um, and bothers me still is the over-reliance on a sort of old pics of celebrities. So for example, this, Heath Ledger commemorative meme was a, one of the pics that was tweeted. Um, of the tweets that I counted, old history and pics had 50% pictures of celebrities, history and pics was 33, and historical pics was 27. Um, and there are, there's also sort of like a small group of stars, like Marilyn Monroe, the Beatles, Kurt Cobain, <laughs> James Dean, Audrey Hepburn, Muhammad Ali, sort of like the ones that you would find in the, if you go to a uh, poster store in a college bookstore <laughs> and you, uh, you go to that uh, flippy um, rack of posters, you would find these people there. Um, and so there's a, there's a sense that, you know, here I go with the sort of like cr uh, shrill critique a little bit, but it is definitely the sense with, in, in these accounts that, the, um, that if something is old, it is history, um, which is, you know, we can have a debate over whether or not that is true. Um, but what, what bothered me more, and which is, I think, best illustrated by this tweet, um, this is a tweet that historical picks tweeted when Hiro Onoda, who was a Japanese soldier who had died recently, um, and he, his life story sort of like looks like a curiosity when it's presented in this tweet. A Japanese soldier who lived on an island for 29 years because he didn't believe World War II was over has passed away. Um, but the Hiro Inoda story is really complicated and interesting. Um, he's living in the jungle and he and his compatriots ended up killing around 30 Filipino villagers over that time. He had various, um, you know, they had various encounters with the people who were living there. Um, and the fact that there's not even a link out to any information you know, is troubling to me. So I found, I was looking at the replies to these tweets. The other thing is that these Twitter accounts don't, um, don't interact with users. So if you could say, you know, one of the users asked, or the followers asked after this tweet was tweeted, hey, what, what was that? Like, what, what was the deal with this story? Um, and uh, they, the actual account did not tweet back, but another user tweeted back with a link to the CNN obituary. So there's sort of this, um, like firehose approach to putting putting historical photos out and not necessarily having a, an a, uh, interaction or engagement with the users. Okay, so the the one good thing about the history and pics phenomenon is it offers a space for some hilarious critiques. <laughs> um, so there are a number of sort of uh, parody or correction accounts out there. There's one called History and Pics Credits that just retweets history and pics tweets with credits attached. <laughs> um, or we have Pick Pedant, who actually um, corrects not just history tweets, but also um, you can probably follow, you might also follow some like science pictures tweets, like there's like earth and pics, and then there's like a whole number of other sort of imitators of the earth and pics approach. Um, and he does uh, sort of yeoman's work researching the actual origins of these photos and trying to, um, trying to treat out their origins. Um, then we have this, Twitter account called A Historical um, Picks, 
which is, takes an absurdist approach. Um, and I don't know if you can read this, but it's, it's um, men on a gallows, and the caption reads, men being punished for tweeting pictures without proper attribu attribution. <laughs> um, so it's a joke, that's not actually what it is, but ahistorical pics, I think they stopped tweeting. I'm sad because I really liked them. Um, in a similar vein is um, this ridiculous, Earth history, amazing. So they tweet a, just a picture of the same piece of toast with different captions, <laughs> um, and they make up the captions. But you know, of course, because it's satire, you can kind of get a sense from the satire of, um, you know, it's it's interesting to see which things they seize upon to to write this satire because um, they're sort of imitating these history and pics accounts. Um, 1964, Charlie Chaplin responds to fan mail aboard his private airship. <laughs> All right, okay, so. And then there's also, um, this is a, a blog called Paleo Future that I would recommend that everyone check out, which is that he generally writes about retrofuturism, which is um, sort of the idea of what people in the past thought the future was gonna be like. But he also has sort of a recurring feature where he fact checks um, the kinds of pictures that come out of historical pics. So for example, this picture of Nikola Tesla supposedly um, moonlighting as a swimming instructor, incorrect. <laughs> So, but he sort of takes you through the process of um, sort of verifying or unverifying these pictures. So, just to show you that it's not always a history in pics, like it's sort of like falling for something that's too good, good to be true is not always the province of history in pics. So, um, this is a teacher's contract, supposedly from 1923, that seems to also go around once every um, maybe four months or six months. And the reason people love it, I think, is that it has uh, stipulations like teachers should not keep company with men, um, teachers should be home between the hours of 8 p.m. and 6 a.m. and less than attendance at school functions, should not lo loiter in downtown ice cream stores, like this kind of thing. So this is a, a, um, a, a supposed histor historical document that conforms with a lot of sort of preconceptions that people have about the way that women were constructed in previous, um, in previous decades, and it's also just like hilariously over the top. Uh, Snopes.com again. <laughs> no one has ever been able to verify the authenticity of these list of rules. I sort of, before I found the Snopes page for this one, a couple um, Twitter historian friends and I were trying to figure out where the first one came from, and we found it sort of reprinted in a bunch of things in Google Books, like um, you know, some some uh, some books from like the 40s had reprinted it as supposedly a teacher's contract from 1910. So it had all different dates on it and it was sort of like scattered all over the place. Snopes found it offered in a number of different guises like a list of rules for sales clerks at W.T. Stewart's department store in New York, floor nurses in a hospital and the employees of a New England carriage works. Um, all attempts to trace the document to its origins inevitably dead end with a photocopy or printed sheet of indeterminate origin and suspiciously modern vintage, writes Snopes. Um, so, okay, so the, that's the accuracy issue, and I kind of wanted to talk about accuracy first to get it out of the way a little bit, um, as it's sort of, to me, one of the sort of like least interesting dimensions of the problems of history online, because um, it's sort of easily checked and verified, and um, it, it does sort of indicate what people like to think happened in history, um, but to me there is sort of more interesting things to talk about. So. Here is uh, another very internet-friendly historical document. Um, this is the, the historical drawing that's uh, colloquially known as Rocket Cat. <laughs> so um, this was sort of, it's a, it, it was first um, came online in 2012. There's a books blogger named Biblio Odyssey, who's actually really great, and I don't mean to in any way impugn him in this uh, discussion. Oh. Um, so it, it, Billy Odyssey put it online in 2012 and described it as coming from a 1584 manuscript, um, which was supposedly a pen. In 2013, oh, this is the way that Biblio Odyssey represented it. Um, in 2013, Mitch Frost, who's a curator at Penn, um, was alerted to the fact that this, this, this piece was sort of getting some traction online. And he decided to go to try, try to find it in Penn's collection. 
Um, and he wrote a really interesting post that sort of unpacked the different, the problems of trying to find something like this when there is a lot of different variants and copies along the way. So he included a number of different images from around the same time that were, had sort of been, you know, um, you know, one person had the idea and then a bunch of people sort of copied it back and forth um, in different, different contexts. Um, he eventually finds the picture, oops, sorry. Um, and he translates the text underneath of the, the final uh, picture that he finds. Uh, create a small, this is the instructions to the person who might want to use the rocket cap for uh, the assault of a castle, <laughs> I guess. Create a small sack like a fire arrow if you would like to get at a town or castle. Seek to obtain a cat from that place. Bind the sack to the back of the cat, ignite it, let it glow well and thereafter let the cat go. So it runs to the nearest castle or town and out of fear it thinks to hide itself where it ends up in bar ha barn hay or straw and then it will be ignited. <laughs> so, so um, you know, writing as an archivist, um, Mitch's interest in this, this document was in the sort of like the replication, the copying, how this stuff sort of got around in people's minds, how people who were, you know, selling their expertise in, um, in warfare were coming up with these ideas and sharing these ideas among each other. And so he wrote, um, though not actually depicting rockets of any kind, these images help demonstrate the enormous demand for manuals on gunnery and explosives in the early modern period as well as the robust world of 16th century manuscript copying and the persistence of illustrations and manuscript forms into print. So he's got like a book historian perspective on it and, um, and you know, it's an intriguing example, it's a fascinating document. So it was picked up widely in 2013 on the web um, and this is the way that it was represented. So you have in the Atlantic, <laughs> this is the headline, do not try to recreate the 16th century German bomb, cat bomb at home. Um, and then it, it you know, came up in, um, on Boing Boing, which is a, a tech blog, kind of hipstery tech blog. Um, cat with bomb strapped to it in the 16th century. And then it kind of, in an interesting way, sort of like laid dormant for a year. This is in 2013 that this, this sort of circulated. Um, and then in 2014, it reemerged, <laughs> the rocket cat. Uh, none worse for the wear, I guess. Um, and it is on Atlas Obscura. And interestingly, I mean, there's this sort of adage that people who write on the web have, or maybe at least at Slate where I work, people have this, which is that you might think that something has been done, but there's like a functionally infinite number of people who have not seen the thing that you think has been overdone. So when Alice Obscura shared this a year after the first sort of cycle of interest, it got 44,000 Facebook shares. So it did well. Um, in that cycle, you also had Fox News writing about it. And then you had the British newspaper Daily Mail um, kind of doing maybe the most sensationalistic <laughs> approach to it. Um, bizarre plans to put explosives on pets, like, ah. Um, and so the first sentence of this, uh, you know, all the careful, you know, work in the provenance, the genealogy of the image, the sort of the historical meaning that, you know, Mitch is so carefully trying to get to. And then the Daily Mail, uh, the first sentence is, a University of Pennsylvania expert has revealed plans to turn pets into weapons. <laughs> like, that's it. So, <laughs> um, I bring up this example to say that, you know, it's not, this is a, a wholly accurate thing that was put on the web, and in general, it was reproduced with accuracy, but it's also that there's a way that all of the sort of the context around it, all of the sort of what um, maybe academic historians or people who are interested in contextualized history would think is like the good part, um, it sort of gets boiled down into this like, look at this cool crazy thing <laughs> sort of attitude, which is really, um, you know, uh, the way that the web is adapted to think in some ways. That's, you know, if you only have a quick hit of like a Facebook post or a, a Twitter, um, a Twitter caption, then, you know, this is, the rocket cat is like way fewer than 140 characters. <laughs> so, you know, it really works. It's a sort of like a, a really movable concept. Okay. So, I, let's talk about um, relatability. So, just so you know where I'm coming from, this is a piece I wrote for Slate in 2014. <laughs> um, I have definite opinions on the idea of the word. Sorry. Um, So in general, I think the word relatable is a, a sort of like an easy stopgap for more careful analysis. I think it's really, um, 
hard to use the word relatable and then get beyond it to say why you think. Like, if you're saying something is relatable, what does that say about um, who you think you are versus who what you think the other thing is? Um, to relate to something is to sort of recognize something in it that you think is amazing or you think is like you, um, but to not elaborate on why something is relatable, in my opinion, <laughs> is to sort of foreclose a lot of analysis. Um, and it also sort of implies that your, um, you know, that your own way of thinking is sort of a universal way of thinking. So that's where I'm coming from with it. So in terms of history on the web and relatability, um, I think the question of relatability and relevance and historical translation is a really intriguing one, theoretically speaking. So you know, it brings up some questions for me. Do you believe that it's possible to know or to, to really know or to feel how people were thinking and feeling historically? Um, you know, to feel of a kind with them, to feel like you know them or you understand um, their emotions. And I have this tweet here from uh, a fellow writer that I actually really liked. <laughs> he says, historical people's consciousness was constructed differently from ours. We can't really ever understand them with claps in between which is for emphasis. <laughs> um, so you know, whether or not you agree with that, I happen to actually agree with it, and I kind of think it makes uh, history more interesting to think that people might have thought differently or be sort of like unreachable in their thinking. Um, there is a, a sort of like a, a definite relatability and analogy approach to history on the web that it seems to be really effective. Um, and so I'm gonna talk a little bit about analogy first and the way that I think the idea that history should be in some way familiar to the consumer um, has affected the way that history is being covered on the web. So the, um, I have a little like a, a list of URLs that I've collected of uh, uh, these kinds of headlines. So here you have a headline, social media, nothing new, commonplace books as predecessor to Pinterest. And then you have before sexting, there was reading aloud, sneak a peek at the Facebook of 400 years ago, um, the original Amazon Prime was invented in 1950s Ontario. <laughs> oh, back to historical pics, reading a twit, tweet in the 1950s with no explanation of what's actually going on in the picture, of course. And, you know, even the New York Times is not immune, a pencil shop for texting the old-fashioned way. Um, so why does this, uh, you know, I know this is like sort of, I, I have... I have been encouraged in the past to use this kind of headline on something that I wrote, and I have... Uh, sort of tried to make an argument for why it doesn't work for me. Um, I think there is a, a lot, of, like, I'm not necessarily sure that everything that's described as having been um, viral or a social network or the, a way of communicating in the past is sort of directly analogous to Twitter or Facebook. And to be, to be fair, it's not, um, you know, if you were to read these articles, there is, a, you know, there are smart people writing them and they're sort of, you know, sometimes they flatten out those comparisons, and then sometimes they are good about sort of disarticulating what the differences might be between the way that people used commonplace books and the way that people use Pinterest. Um, but there is, there is sort of like a reflexive tendency to want to make that absolute connection in order to connect with it. It's almost like an imagined reader. I actually don't really know how well these headlines work, um, but there is definitely a sort of like a rote tendency in the minds of web editors and web writers to use those kinds of historical comparisons. Um, that brings me to, oh yeah, so oh yeah, I wanted to mention also, so I recently read a blog post by historian Mark Cheatham, who's a, a, a historian who writes a lot about Andrew Jackson, and he's recently been asked quite often to compare, to comment on the following statement. <laughs> Donald Trump is today's Andrew Jackson. <laughs> um, and he wrote um, this paragraph which really sort of got at the problem for me. He wrote, uh, what I've concluded is the real question isn't, is Trump a modern day Jackson? It's actually, what leads US voters to support a mostly successful businessman he, mostly in parentheses he has, <laughs> who wants to build a wall to keep out immigrants, speaks disparagingly about women, feigns religious piety to court voters, and shows no self-awareness that he could be wrong. 
You can see what uh, Mark Cheatham thinks about Trump. <laughs> Um, that's the real historical parallel that needs to be drawn, in my opinion. I think commentators we be will be better served by looking at other politicians in U.S. history who more closely resembled Trump's true ideology and perspective and explain why people were attracted to them. Or you could compare the zeitgeist of different eras, which may offer a better explanation than looking at personalities. Or you could focus on groups like the Populist Party, the Dixiecrats, or the Birchers, the John Birch Society, that used anger toward and resentment of the government in order to make sense of Trump and his supporters. So he's proposing a number of different sort of avenues to do it, and you can see how with the social media comparisons, that could also be something that you might be able to do. You know, you compare the sort of media zeitgeist of the 16th century versus now. Um, and of course, that's a much bigger sort of article and a much bigger argument, um, but it's almost a more honest way into me. Um, I can see why the headline, Trump is the modern day Andrew Jackson, would do better than you know, <laughs> this sort of more careful discussion that he's talking about. But these are the kinds of um, you know, questions that make it hard to bring forth the nuance in these sort of parallels and comparisons. All right, so in terms of historical relatability, so that this I was talking about historical analogy, and now I'm going to talk a little bit about relatability. So this is the most egregious example um, is the Twitter account Medieval Reactions. Does anyone follow that account? Ha ha ha, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think this is a British Twitter account, and like History and Pics, it has many imitators. Um, and I actually think they delete their tweets as they go along so that they can't be reappropriated or repurposed. Um, and they take uh, images from medieval manuscripts and append um, captions to them. So let's see. On the left is, when you play the whole village, your mixtape. Um, and on the right is, when you're trying to sneak away from the one night stand, but she catches you. <laughs> OK, so it's funny, right? <laughs> um, so but this is, there, this is playing with historical material without it all. Well, A, of course, there was no way to tell from these tweets where this stuff came from, where the actual images came from. Um, I don't know whether it would be better to necessarily add a link to the images here. Um, I mean, I think they're funny, don't get me wrong. <laughs> um, and I think a lot, of, uh, a lot of historians feel similarly. You have like a laugh and then you have a how dare they kind of reaction. <laughs> um, and I think to sort of unpack or parse the how dare they reaction a little, it has to do with um, this feeling of, you know, th there's a, the account is sort of capitalizing on the strangeness of the images. The, the, you know, you think when you look at an image like the one on the right, like what, what could possibly, what was that image used for in the first place? Or, you know, how ridiculous that they use those kinds of images in medieval times, or, you know, what were they even thinking? But the tweet never answers that question. Instead, there's this sort of like implied um, relationship between what the person who made the image was doing and what you might be experiencing in your life. Um, and it's sort of like an unearned relationship. There's not really much um, besides your sort of like mocking view of history and your own uh, experiences to sort of substantiate it or um, you know, make it have much depth or meaning. Now that could be, this is another one that um, made me super cringe, which is a historical pics. <laughs> Um, comparison picture on the left you have, a, well it's undated so I don't know when it's from or who those guys are or anything else about it, um, but you have two guys with, I believe it's a mortar tube, someone can correct me, am I right? History, okay, you know, okay. Um, and, then, and then you have another guy from 2009. And so the caption, men never change, dot, dot, dot. So this is a, a sort of a argument for continuity of certain traits of gender. <laughs> Um, that is uh, highly retweetable. Everyone loved it. It was definitely a super popular tweet for them. Um, but it's sort of it's uh, it's making a, it's obviously making an argument about what it means to be a man, men's relationship to war, um, this sort of like relationship between sex and war. And because it's a historical pics account, that gets seen as um, a sort of almost more, like more official or more more serious in some way. Um, and again, people loved it. So who am I to judge, I guess? All right, so I guess I am judging. All right, so <laughs> um, I, for a more sort of like nuanced look at this problem of relatability or continuity or um, like universality of human experience, 
I wrote about the website Letters of Note, which is a website run by, a, I think he's British also, Sean Usher, um, a blogger. And it's a really popular website that does really well, that re, um, runs historical letters with a little bit of commentary at the top. Um, and so I, I wrote this review of the Letters of Note book. He has a coffee table book with like the most popular letters sort of arranged in a, like a hodgepodge fashion. And, um, and I, I wrote this review that was really sort of self-searching in a lot of ways because I saw that what he was doing was something that I in a lot of ways was sort of replicating on the Vault blog. There's a problem with um, you know, the, the experience, the practice of selecting individual documents and sharing individual documents one by one uh, sort of puts you immediately in danger of decontextualization and like a lack of chronological framework, which is why I did the timeline <laughs> for my blog so that I could see where things fit next to each other. Um, but Letters of Note is explicitly a project where, you know, in the introduction to the book, Usher writes, you know, I, I, my goal is to try to write something that's not like another history book, like it should be something that you want to read, which immediately I was like, I want to read history books. <laughs> I don't know. Who do, you, who do you think I am? But this, more so, what interested me about reading the book and sort of uh, breaking down what what kinds of letters got picked. Um, there are letters from famous people that have like a, an interest value because of who wrote it. There's letters that have to do with like, uh, you know, a thing, uh, famous things that happened, like Alec Guinness writing to a friend while he was um, doing Star Wars and saying like, this Harrison Ford guy, he's like just a little pipsqueak or something, I can't remember what he said, <laughs> um, making sort of a derogatory comment about young Harrison Ford. So. This is the kind of thing that Letters of Note runs, but they also do play with this like relatability, uh, universality of human experience um, paradigm. So they would, um, you know, there's a couple of Letters of Note that I mentioned in the review, like a letter from Charles Lamb to Bernard Barton in 1824, describing how he felt at the tail end of a lingering head cold. And he wrote, I am flatter than denial or a pancake, emptier than Judge Park's wig when the head is in it, <laughs> duller than a country stage when the actors are off it, a cipher, an O. Um, and another entry, another uh, letter along those lines is a, a form letter that ninth century Chinese bureaucrats used to apologize um, when they'd been drunk at a party and had made a fool of themselves, they would send this letter. So you can see how there's like a, um, a sense in which letters of note is playing on this idea that we 21st century people would recognize these human experiences that are somehow universal. Now, um, again, whether or not you think that is problematic sort of depends on whether you think human experience is universal. Hmm. But some other examples that I have here sort of break that down a little bit more, I think. So there's this persistent um, sort of theme or trope in historical coverage on the internet um, that has to do with badassery. <laughs> Um, and this is a headline from TheVerge.com introducing a post about um, some uh, um, Depression era photos. I believe they were FWI photos. Oh, am I forgetting that? Yeah. Okay. So, um, and th these are photos of kids who are kind of like playing in trash heaps <laughs> and like playing, one of them is playing, I believe, on a dead horse. Um, these kinds of <laughs> sort of extreme conditions which are, were endemic in the Depression. And they were sort of taken as, a, you know, if you know anything about those projects, they were taken uh, so the government could kind of record what conditions were going on around the country during the Depression, during the war. Um, and so they, they're being sort of reappropriated by, in this case, The Verge, to make an argument that we're soft or in some way, um, you know, that we have, sort of uh, fallen back into this uh, you know, cushiony world of screens and nice couches and whatever it is. And there's a way that, um, you know, I, the, a headline like this deeply sort of confounds me because as a historian of childhood, I know that um, the people who were taking these pictures and the people who were living these childhoods quite often would have wanted nothing more than to not be as badass as they had to be. <laughs> um, you know, they didn't necessarily want to have to play on a dead horse, and in fact, that's probably deeply unsanitary. And so um, there's a way that sort of uh, grabbing this sort of evidence of past suffering is a way that um, 
you know, there, the website is making a commentary on the way that we maybe have sort of fallen from grace, but at the same time, they're missing this whole sort of historical context. And it would be interesting to, you know, to actually write about that, to write like, hey, look, look at the different conditions that childhood um, people had in childhood in the 1930s and think about the difference between today and, and then and what does it mean, but that doesn't make a very good headline. <laughs> um, similarly, historical assholes <laughs> are a big sort of uh, web, uh, sort of web fodder. So this is the Forgotten Assholes of History web series, which I got a uh, press release for. Um, the Woman Who Helped Kill Lincoln is one of the most recent episodes. And um, Cracked.com, which the History Club told me they often surfed, has a sort of similar approach. Um, so the history landing page on Cracked.com yesterday, um, the six greatest moments in wartime smack talk, <laughs> and five first ladies more badass than their husbands is all the way on the right. Um, so, you know, I think it kind of does, actually Cracked, I found while I was looking back at it, does a little bit more sort of interesting things than that. There's this kind of amazing um, interview with a Viet Cong soldier, five th eight things Vietnam War movies leave out by an enemy soldier. Um, it, it's, it was interesting to me because I see very little coverage of Vietnam in online history. I don't know why. I think maybe because it's not um, an easy conflict to break down or to try to understand. Um, it's not easy to sort of, you know, figure out which you know, what the like agreed upon memory or experience of it, of it is, the way that it is for World War II, especially World War II and also the Civil War. Um, and then the last, uh, this is the, la the worst way that this relatability paradigm works, which is these quizzes that medievalist.net, which <laughs> medievalist.net is a weird creature because sometimes they'll do, um, they actually do a lot of, they'll read sort of uh, scholarly articles and write a little bit about the scholarly article, but then they, I think they're trying to be sort of more clickable or more shareable, and so they'll do these quizzes like this. This is uh, what medieval torture method would you use on your enemies if you want to find information? Um, and so this is like a, like a fracture of relatability to me. <laughs> um, it, it's sort of a, it actually is really interesting to think about, because it's like, um, you know, you, <laughs> You wouldn't ever want to imagine yourself in that position, but actually this quiz kind of imagines that you might want to imagine yourself in that position, and maybe that, that is like a kind of, maybe a little reality of why some people are interested in the medieval, medieval era. Um, I don't know, but it, if you can kind of like dive inside the psychology of the person who wrote this, that's sort of a little bit of what's implied. Now this is what, uh, a couple ways that these ideas of relatability have um, changed the way that I have blogged on the vault. Um, I wrote about these uh, air raid, these uh, bombing damage maps that the Japanese military um, posted in carriers that were taking demobbed soldiers back to Japan at the end of the war. Um, and they were, there are a, a variety of Japanese cities you can find in the archive, um, like 20 or 30 different maps. And um, this post did not do very well. Um, I thought it would because the maps are really cool and uh, the story behind it is really interesting in my opinion. Um, but I, I sort of think that there was a, like a breakdown of relatability here. So I think that it was hard for people to share this because um, it, it sort of maybe implies that you have sympathy or that you're in some way um, you know, aligned with the people who suffered all of this damage. Um, this, on the other hand, was one that really worked, which was a letter that Helen Keller wrote to uh, German students, I believe it was in 1933, who were burning her book. Um, and it was really kind of angry and amazing. <laughs> and so um, it worked because you were think, sort of thinking of yourself at, at that time. You know, she was really prescient to have seen this danger and to call, to call it out in that way. Um, and that's like a fully commendable thing. Um, and it really, I think, worked for people to I think, it were, I think people like to read and to share stuff that is about um, people living in a dangerous, dark time who recognize the dangerousness and the darkness and act against it. That's kind of a fun thing to imagine. You like to sort of imagine yourself that way. Um, and then here's a headline that, this is, I, I share this by way of saying that I did not, I do not in any way deserve to be like counting myself apart from this kind of scourge of relatability, because I do it too. <laughs> like, this was an amazing 
um, actually not the CIA, the pre precursor of the CIA um, guide that was written during World War II for people who are living in occupied countries in Europe who could um, basically monkey wrench, do stuff in their workplaces to slow down the production process. Um, but it's also psychological, so it's different ways that you could mess with meetings, like slow things down, basically just like drag your feet and create problems for your employers. Um, and so I kind of, you know, I wrote this headline and I went, oh, am I gonna really do this? <laughs> okay. And it worked and people really liked it because, you know, you recognize all those techniques that the CIA is, or the, um, uh, the pre-CIA is, uh, is advocating using. Um, you recognize it from your own workplace. And I knew it would work and I kind of hated myself, but I did it anyway. Now, I, I also do think, um, you know, my work at Slate has shown me also that I think it is definitely possible to write about stuff that has kind of like no explicit connection to today's world and no, maybe has like a relatability quotient, but that you don't call it out per se. So I, um, I wrote this piece called Boyhood that was about this archive that's actually at Amherst College, um, this archive of materials that a group of brothers in the late 19th century created. So they created what's called a paracosm, which is like a, a little mini world of your own um, in the woods behind their house. And then they wrote at night, they would like write these little pamphlets to describe what was going on in their paracosm. Um, and those pamphlets somehow got preserved and Amherst has them now. Um, so I wrote about it and a couple of the people at Slate were like, do you wanna like make a comparison to Minecraft or like say something about, you know, why um, you know, we don't do this today because we're looking at iPads. And I was like, I don't need to, really. I don't think so. And actually, people liked the piece a lot. And a couple of times I did see tweets saying, like, we won't have this today because of iPads. And I was like, meh, they can do it. <laughs> at least I didn't do it. <laughs> it wasn't me. Because um, who knows what the Nelson brothers would have done if they had iPads. Maybe it would have been also amazing, but just in an iPad. I don't know. OK, so now we're at exploitation. Um, this is probably the sort of like the darkest corner of what happens with history on the web, in my opinion. So these are two headlines from, these are super clickbait headlines. You guys probably recognize these, like if you go on a place like weather.com, all the way at the bottom of the page, you, you see the most ridiculous examples of this. Um, but Slate has them too, like lots of places um, contract with this. Slate does it through this outfit called Outbrain, which is like a, um, kind of like a content delivery deal that you get paid a certain amount of money if you let Outbrain put stuff on your page. It's like this whole sort of other income stream. So these are two that I caught over the years that sort of signified this to me. So uh, at the top here is this, you know, see the rare haunting mental asylum photos. Um, this idea that uh, old mental asylums are scary and haunted is extremely persistent. <laughs> Um, you know, you just have to watch horror movies or go on like a ghost tour and see this kind of replicate itself over and over. Um, and this rare Vietnam War photos are so creepy, no wonder they were classified for the past 50 years, has this, um, this kind of like, uh, well, it has a clickbait quality to it, right? Because you're like, I wonder what's in the Vietnam War photos. And actually, they were not that creepy, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and this sort of like discovery feeling to it. Um, and I see... Uh, this isn't just a clickbait phenomenon. I also see a lot of sort of um, photos of dark things that have happened in history or sort of other records, other documents of dark things that have happened in history on Pinterest and Tumblr. Um, this is uh, one user who has a, a Pinterest page called Poor Things, which is she's sort of using um, a mixture of historical and non-historical photos to basically the frame is that she wants to remind herself to be grateful about her life. Um, but there's this way that it's also sort of a collection of atrocities. Um, I wrote about the problem of sharing um, historical medical images online in 2014. Um, I, it was sort of prompted by this book that had just come out with a bunch of images from the Welcome Library of, uh, in Britain of uh, really bad like skin diseases and uh, problems with, you know, uh, it, was, it was illustrations from the 18th and 19th century of skin diseases and other very visible, very sort of like disfiguring conditions. Um, and I was sort of prompted to write this piece by 
um, headlines like this, which is the headline that Wired put on its piece about the, that same book, Awesomely Gross Medical Illustrations from the 19th Century. Um, so you get this sense that, you know, if you click on it, you're going to sort of like have a, like it'll be like a challenge, like it'll be like a charge or something, like it'll kind of like be amazing for you. It'll be gross, but you'll be like a kind of like hyped up by it. So I wrote, I wrote a sort of critique of it, and I wanted to make the argument that um, not basically that not all historical images are created equal. Um, you guys can debate with me over whether or not you agree with that. But I think that there are some images that sort of capture, um, you know, the darkest points of people's lives, whether it be, you know, they have a horrible skin disease or, you know, they're enslaved and they've been persistently whipped and someone took a picture of their back or whatever it is. Um, and so I proposed that we do, um, we do this. So this is kind of an experiment that we did within the article that I wrote for Slate where I did include the images from the Welcome Library book, but then I, we put like a, like a veil over them with the caption underneath so you could see what you were gonna see when you clicked. Um, but you had, my idea was that it would give you like one more second to think about it or to, not, not even to like warn you away, but just to think like, okay, I'm seeing something that was real for someone and was terrible, so let me take a second. Um, and you could debate over that, because actually, like, in some way, maybe this kind of veil is more titillating, I don't know. Um, you could you know, argue over that, but I was trying to sort of think of ways that you could make a technological affordance that would create that feeling of like a partness or respect with that, with that kind of imagery. Um, something that, um, uh, a really sort of popular uh, interactive that we did at Slate was the Atlantic Slave Trade in Two Minutes that we did this last summer. I wasn't personally involved in making the interactive because I'm not that technologically able, but um, it was Andrew Kahn who made it. And I, it, it is basically you can press play and you can see all of the voyages go across the Atlantic. Um, you can pause and click on the different ships and see the, like, where the ship left from and where they came in and how many people they had on it. Um, it's using the transatlantic slave trade database, which is a really amazing um, sort of project that historians have worked on for a really long time. And I actually got an email the other day from Britt Russert, who's a professor here, who's not here this semester, sadly. Um, and she, she is writing an article sort of critiquing this in Atlantic slave trade in two minutes and other sort of um, digital coverage of the history of slavery in various ways. And she was uh, kind enough to allow me to share a little bit of her critique of it. Um, this is an unpublished article. And so she wrote, um, how do we understand the tagline attached to the map that regards it as a haunting animation? And that, that's actually the promo copy. Um, so this is the sort of the headline and then the promo copy is what's attached to it that you would see in like a tweet or on Facebook. What precisely, if at all, makes the animation itself haunting? Uh, does it have to do with something represented on the map itself with the haunting transmigration of slavery and its various representations across time? or possibly with the ways the images spectrally maps a newer set of unfreedoms and forced migrations in the 21st century. And this is the part that really got me. <laughs> is it possible that the lure, the lure of the slave trade represented in only quote unquote two minutes speaks more to the global flows and accelerated temporalities of the neoliberal present than the specific temporalities and spatialities of the slave past? In other words, is this perhaps an image of our present as much as it is an image of the past? Um, and what about the stark contrast between the facile transportability and clickability of this visualization versus the excruciatingly slow movement of captive people who are shackled and transported on slave ships? So um, this is to me an extremely trenchant critique, you know, standing on the other side of the counter as it were, you know, standing on the, um, the side of things where I'm trying to, um, you know, think about the way that someone at Slate might think about something that would move on the internet well. I can see where she's coming from. I also know why we arranged the interactive the way that we did. The word haunting, for some reason, is like a, a good internet word. Um, it's <laughs> somehow it's better than sad. Um, you know, these are there are things that are sad, and then there are things that you see that you think about for a while. And for some reason, the latter is what people click on. Um, the logic of the interactive is that readers can kind of. Um, you know, the, being able to interact, being able to stop it, being able to click on each, each boat and see the conditions of that particular voyage are uh, like a feeling of like accessibility and power that people on the internet are increasingly used to, I think. There's a way that users are sort of acculturated to 
um, to expect this sort of like ease of ease of accessibility and like prolifer like prolifer proliferation and availability of data. Um, the two minutes, the idea that it can all happen in two minutes also plays into this sense of power. Um, everything happens quickly on the web and when you're surfing. Um, everything is sort of uh, an attenuated smaller time frame and this, the two minutes plays into this idea. Um, I don't think she's wrong. I don't think Britt is wrong at all. Um, so we're back to the cool factor there as well. Okay, so I realize this all may have sounded super negative, and I don't want to end on that note. <laughs> so I want to talk about some of my favorite online historical stuff, which happens on Tumblr. Um, so there, there are people who are fans of the Founding Fathers with everything that the word fan implies. <laughs> um, so for example, um, this, this, this has become more sort of prevalent after the advent of the musical Hamilton, which everyone on the internet and especially on Tumblr seems to love. Um, but this started happening before that and I was sort of following it before then. Um, and so here is a, um, you know, a post from a user who had been like a longtime Founding Fathers fan who was trying to introduce uh, the people who were new to Tumblr Founding Father fandom because of Hamilton to the names of the couples. Um, so the, there's Alexander Hamilton and John Lawrence as lambs, Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr as hamburger, <laughs> Alexander Hamilton and Tom Jefferson as Jamilton, et cetera. So I think she's kind of messing with them a little bit, <laughs> um, although some of those are right, but I don't think that Alexander Hamilton, Thomas Jefferson, and James Madison is the Virginia ham sandwich. <laughs> um, so, um, so yeah, so these are um, names of, I should say quickly for anyone who's sort of unfamiliar with this concept, they're names of ships, which is the idea, um, it comes from the word relationship, and it's kind of this idea, shipping is a verb, and if you ship a particular couple, it means you like to think about them getting together. And so the classic ship, we discussed this the other night, is um, Kirk and Spock, is kind of like the originator ship. <laughs> um, but, uh, you can also do it for people who actually do end up getting together, whatever, there's all kinds of like permutations, but on Tumblr, a lot of times, people seem to ship um, couples that will never get together in the actual, um, the actual, either the historical timeline or the fan fiction, whatever it is, I mean, that you know, the actual universe of the show, whatever it is, like the example I always think of is the people who ship Sam and Dean Winchester, the brothers on Supernatural, and that's never gonna happen on the show, but they ship it nonetheless. So. There are people on Tumblr shipping founding fathers together, and some of them are using <laughs> actual historical, um, you know, implications. You know, there's, mm, it depends on who you ask it. Some people believe that um, John Lawrence and Alexander Hamilton actually did have, um, you know, a, a kind of a friendship or a relationship that beyond, went beyond simple friendship. Um, we don't know that, and I actually think most the historians who write about Lawrence would say that's not necessarily true, but people on Tumblr really believe it. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, so this is a search for the hashtag lambs, which is the Lawrence Hamilton ship. Um, here they do fan art. So this is like a fan art of uh, Hamilton and Lawrence in, um, during the war, looking at the stars with a sextant. And then she says, I don't know if that's historically accurate. Oh, well, LOL. <laughs> she doesn't care. <laughs> um, uh, here's one that's not about a ship, but that's about how to hug uh, James Madison. Um, oh, you can't read it. And basically it's all jokes about how short and small he is and how careful you have to be. <laughs> um, and there's a really interesting, uh, it's funny and it's full of humor and it's full of sort of like, uh, like I feel like good, uh, it's good hearted. Um, and I think it in some ways really uh, is a way for people to sort of claim history in a way that is, um, feels really personal to them and they get really invested and they go really deep. Um, and they also uh, sort of, uh, sort of align themselves purposefully against academic um, historians. So <laughs> here's a joke. So this is the user of Power Bottom, Bruce Wayne. Sorry, this is dirty. <laughs> um, <laughs> so this is a joke that um, she wrote. Uh, historian punches me in the face. Say it. Me. Never. <laughs> historian. Say that John Lawrence wasn't in love with Alexander Hamilton. They were only friends. No homo. They were just bros. Say it. Me. Spits blood on their face. Fuck you. <laughs> so, okay. I guess that's where I'm ending. So I love that. <laughs> I know. I love this because it's, I mean, it's profane. I'm sorry. I should have maybe given a profanity warning. Um, it's, it's profane. It's dirty. It's kind of like a little bit unhinged. Um, but I think in its unhingedness, it's 
trying to do something that, um, for example, history and picks is not doing. You know, these people are going back and forth with each other. They're sort of figuring out with each other what they think about particular um, historical moments. Some of them are obviously more invested than others. Some of them are actually like reading Lawrence's letters and seeing what they think about um, the situation. Um, and then some of them are just making jokes and like like memes and just having fun. Um, but I love to see it because it 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 shows engagement and it shows enthusiasm. All right, here are some links where you can find some of the stuff that I talked about in the talk. Thank you very much. It didn't run out. Is there time for questions? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. I want that. If anyone wants to I can also come to you too. We can do an open forum. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Is it working? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Hi, Jennifer. Um, yeah. I have a question about the history of the So, one thing that interests me about history, and this is really interesting because I, I feel like it didn't, it didn't really come up in your talk. Okay. Um, is the it. the paradigm of history as a as a foreign country, mm -hmm. um, or you know, history is just weird. Um, yeah. Do you do you see that as a as something that plays out on the internet much? Yeah, um, that's sort of like the flip side of the relatability idea. Yeah. Um, yeah, and in a way, I actually think medieval React sort of draws on that a little bit. Um, you know, there's a sort of implication in those images that there's no way you could possibly understand what the heck those uh, medieval people were doing with those. Um, and yeah, and there's actually there's actually a site called Weird History that is pretty popular that is just kind of like quirky, offbeat things. Um, yeah, and I probably should have incorporated more of that. But, uh, but yeah, I think it's, it's interesting to think, to think about because it is, it's decontextualized also, but it's decontextualized in a different way. Um, like you can have the decontextualized, they're just like us reaction, mm -hmm. and you can have the decontextualized, I can never understand this reaction. And they both seem to play. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Can I add yeah, yeah, sure. really quick? Um, one of my favorite uh, history on the internet things is, um, I don't know if it's active anymore, but um, medieval people of color, mm -hmm. um, yeah. mm -hmm. which I think the is Tumblr. doing a great thing. You know, it's mm -hmm. kind of like saying, actually, this stuff is historical, even though it doesn't seem like it's historical in the kind of dominant narrative. Totally, and that's on Tumblr too. Yeah. Tumblr has is housing a lot of that stuff, I think. Hi, I'm Catherine. Thank you again for educating me about what shipping is. I feel a lot <laughs> more hip yeah. now. Um, okay. <laughs> but so my question is, if I, I, please correct me if I'm wrong. But okay. uh, from from sure. your talk, I kind of interpreted that the the issues on the the on the web are something that perhaps we should try to fix. Mm. And okay, okay, <laughs> so maybe I'm wrong. No, no, no. <laughs> I don't know. I mean. That is a really fair question. Like I just spent 40 minutes or 50 minutes talking about everything that was wrong. Um, I don't know. I mean, is it's not fixable, really. I mean, what am I going to do? I, I mean, I write these like argumentative essays, and <laughs> like the people who like them are usually already historians, <laughs> and they really like them. Um, I mean, I think. I mean, I guess I do think that there are there is there is better stuff that's. There's better stuff and more stuff, like even on the same site, you know, like it, there can be, um, like The Atlantic does really amazing historical stuff. Tanazi Coates is an amazing historical writer, um, and he's really popular on the web. But there's like, I feel like there's different sort of like niches of popularity, and some of the stuff is like, it works because of how quick and decontextualized it is. Like, could you imagine doing a better medieval reacts? Or like, I, I run a, um, a Twitter feed that's related to my blog at Slate Vault uh, plug, <laughs> and uh, and I do you know up, I do pictures, but I also have like a link to context, and I do like a much wider range of coverage. Um, you know, sometimes I'll do War War II or Vonnegut or whatever it is, but mostly it's like you know just a wider range of stuff. Um, and I'm just not nearly as popular, so I don't know. I mean, in some ways, I think that the appeal of that stuff is that it's sort of like flying free from all of this like pesky explanation and whatever. I don't know, what do you think? Do you think it's fixable? Or? 
<laughs> yeah. I, mean, I just, I, I don't know, if we deploy an army, maybe. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's so much of it, and it's multiplying. Right. We need to hire an army of Russian trolls. Army of fact Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Reverse trolls. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I'm going to stand. Um, maybe I should stand up. Hi. Oh, I'm always surprised by what my voice sounds like. Um, <laughs> so I want to thank you for your talk. I really enjoyed it. And I, mm. I have two questions, comments, I guess. I'm thinking about um, something you noted about, in some ways, like the teachability of, of these moments, right? So like mm -hmm. when I teach LGBT history, there's just really great, um, I use things like the onion, right? Like, I mean, these are things like these, to deconstruct this as a class, right? Um, but there's also this one moment of where Fox News uses an image um, of a butch, non-conforming, you know, gender non-conforming lesbian um, who's uh, getting married to a gender-conforming femme uh, woman, and they're like, "This is why, you know," um, it, and they use that image to promote heterosexual marriage, completely oblivious to the fact that this is a lesbian couple. Mm -hmm. And then, as a, you know, we do this together, and we look at why that's significant. Like, I was wondering yeah. if perhaps. Um, you could comment a little bit more on how we might translate this to the classroom and really kind of mm. look at some of these um, things together as, as a class. Um, and then coupled yeah. with that, that's kind of separate question, if that's okay. Um, oh, I'm also sure. thinking about your section on uh, relatability. Um, and so many of the examples you gave us here are Rela re relatability almost is synonymous here with whiteness. And I, mm -hmm. it's really hard to ignore yeah. um, the power of you know, associating Emmett Till to um, you know, Michael Brown or, or, or Trayvon Martin and the power of that's done for, you know, the, the, the power behind that and what that's done for Black Lives Matter is as, as difficult as, you know, as difficult as it might be, right, to think about continuity and context and changes over time, but it's been so powerful to affecting change. So if we could totally, also just think yeah. about, about that in a different way. Totally. I mean, I don't, I definitely don't mean to say that all historical analogy is facile and wrong. And I think that, um, you know, there are many instances of people who do it really well, who can, you know, um, like, I mean, the shorthand is, you know, Emmett Till, Trayvon, Michael Brown, all these people, but then the sort of like the longhand is, you know, what's the history of policing? Um, and people are doing that, and people are doing the work of saying, you know, like what, um, you know, what is the context of, of, uh, of the situation in Ferguson, what was the, you know, if you heard the This American Life with the sort of like amazing backstory of the school in Ferguson. Um, so that is happening, and I'm, I don't in any way mean to say that I don't like that. Um, in terms of teaching, I think it could be really awesome to look at um, tweets from a history and pics kind of account and then have students try to figure out like where the picture is from, um, and then, you know, you can do reverse Google image search, obviously, um, and then, you can, you could also have them sort of come up with a list of like questions that you might want to know about the picture or about the caption, you know, it's the, the sort of that primary source exercise of like basically, which is what I do whenever I write a vault post, which is to say like, I have this document, like what are the different kind of dimensions within which I would like to know more about it? Here's like a list of questions. How would I find out more about it if I were going to be trying to find out? First of all, thank you so much for this uh, great talk. For those that don't know me, I'm Sam Redman in the History Department. Just two quick questions, both about writing. Okay. Um, one, has writing for the web influenced, changed, shaped your writing for other venues? So for instance, you're writing a book. Mm -hmm. uh, does just you know the act of maybe thinking about audience and unique audiences, has that changed your writing at all? And then the second question, um, I know you talking about volume of writing, you write a lot, uh -huh. and you also often write on deadlines. Um, yeah. And I thought, you know, I, I worked for a newspaper ever so briefly. Actually, you worked in the media as well. And I think we've uh -huh. had conversations about yeah. how volume of writing, having to write on a deadline, can actually be a, 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 a helpful skill to sort of have, or a helpful sort of pressure for a writer. Can you talk a little bit more about how you approach yeah. writing and maybe how that's changed in the last couple of years, if at all? Totally. Um, I apologize to anyone if I'm repeating myself because I think I said this yesterday at the breakfast meeting. Um, <laughs> poor Rebecca has seen it like three times. Okay, so <laughs> um, the way that, the, for the first question, uh, it's made, it's been, I had a persistent problem throughout graduate school which was that I was bad at argumentation and much better at like lining up lists of evidence and sort of putting them in a structure and then I would just be like, here you go, <laughs> here, here it is, here's my like list of archival sources that work together in some way that I'm not 
directly articulating to you because I'm not confident enough to do it. Um, and writing for the web, especially writing for Slate, I have a really good editor who's basically like, what do you mean? <laughs> like you have to, and I've just, it's just become much more second nature to me so that when I returned to my dissertation and turned it into a book manuscript, it was so much easier for me just to be like, I just, I need to sort of like speak in my own voice instead of relying so much on A, what other people have said, or B, the evidence itself um, to make the argument for me. I need to be more sort of present in the writing. Um, and that, it, writing for Slate has been super helpful for that. Um, in terms of writing on deadline, um, it's, a, it's the best way to avoid like research paralysis, which was also another problem for me in grad school, was like the just, I just kept on looking at stuff and kind of was unable to stop um, pulling stuff into my Zotero and then not looking at it and like <laughs> this kind of like feeling of like accumulation or like, um, you know, curiosity that w was hard to actually translate into, um, into writing when I had these like long, far out deadlines. Um, of course, the downside of that is now that I have to write stuff so quickly, um, I also have to be satisfied with the amount that I'm able to research in the time that I have. And I'm sure that there's a lot of ways that the things that I write could be you know, richer or better if I have more time to let it breathe or more time to return to it. Um, but I just, I have to do the best that I can with the time that I have. Um, yeah. Well, you, your talk raised a number of questions. I just want to ask one, because I think this one is the one of the most general interest. Okay. And that is, I always make a distinction between accuracy of interpretation and accuracy of detail. And mm -hmm. like when you showed the picture of the teacher's contract from the 1920s, mm -hmm. that was inaccurate probably in terms of the detail. But the fact that statistically we know that the majority of school districts did fire teachers when they got married. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, there's a truth to that. And mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. g give another example. Um, you know, when Herman Melville's writing Benito Sereno about the Amistad revolt, and he's talking about the inability of white people to imagine African Americans revolting. I mean, there's a real truth to that, even if the details aren't quite what they should be. And, and Hollywood hmm. goes crazy trying to get the buttons right on everything, oh, yeah. and doesn't spend any time at all thinking about interpretation. And I guess I'm thinking about you know, the role of academic historians. Being history cops is kind of boring. But no, I, agree. I think I totally what's really agree with you. interesting <laughs> yeah. is to think about the ways that maybe the public is actually getting at some really deeper truths in their inaccuracies that oh. they have in the details. I, I totally agree with you. I mean, that's part of the, re like when I wrote that piece about history and picks, it was sort of because I was frustrated with the degree to which accuracy was the question. Um, I don't know, I, I think, um, and I totally agree with you about the, you know, the, the futility of critiquing historical fiction in that way, um, or the, like the uninterestingness, I guess, is maybe the more the better way to put it. I think with something like the teacher's contract, it's being circulated, and this is a, another sort of quality of the web, maybe especially of, of social media networks, um, things that are circulated as documents are accorded this like kind of mystique, <laughs> like this idea that it's like a, this is a real document is something that helps it move. Um, and so it might be, I don't know, I, I think it still bothers me as a history cop, in my history cop like uh, form, to see something like that teacher's contract be circulated as like an actual document. Um, be because even if it is the case that there are stringent sort of restrictions laid on teachers, I doubt that the actual, in fact we found while I was doing the sort of research on that um, to try to find the actual document before I saw the Snopes, Snopes link, um, we found an actual um, list of rules for teachers and it just was like super boring. Like most of them were really mundane. There are the things like, you know, if you get married, you have to quit these kinds of structures. But a lot of them are like, like on that list, almost every bullet point is interesting and funny, <laughs> and um, and like sort sort of speaks to this image. And and on a in the actual contract that we were able to find, it just was much less like clear. And I mean, it's the way that you're, you know, when you're doing actual historical research, the gems are few and far between. Like quite often, like a lot of the times, it's like a lot of mundanity. And then like occasionally there's an interesting thing. Um, and so I think in that particular case, it bothers me to see the representation of it as a document in part because it sort of belies the actual 
um, the maybe the actual mundaneness of the situation. Does that make sense? Okay. You just like it. <laughs> I was unconvincing, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much.